And all the guys, people said, great to be with you today. Looking forward to our uh, passage that we're going to kind of break down. If you have your Bibles, you can pull them out to Matthew chapter 16. If you don't have a Bible, uh, we would encourage you to bring it on a regular basis. We just feel like when you open up your Bible, there's something that happens when you engage in it that doesn't happen otherwise. But if you don't have it, that's fine. Just You can pull out your phone and Google Matthew chapter 16 and then get down to the, down to the verses that we're at today. We're looking at Matthew 16. 21, 22, and 23. Uh, we're walking through three verses. There's a reason why this has taken so long to get through Matthew, but we're just doing the best we can to go verse by verse by verse and allowing uh, uh, teachings and uh, concepts uh, and doctrine and theology uh, to be taught, allowing God to lead us through his word. Now, as a reminder, uh, it's really important, especially in, in, in our uh, understanding of our passage today, Matthew writes this gospel to his fellow countrymen, the Jewish people, to prove to them that Jesus is indeed the Old Testament Messiah. But as we're going to see today, many of the people that he's teaching, don't, they have a wrong concept of what that Messiah was going to be, and so he constantly shows them in the Old Testament uh, how this is true. And so really in the end, it's a 28-chapter argument using the Old Testament, Israel's history, then Matthew showing Jesus in real time through his teaching ministry and miracles that he is indeed that guy. Now, to help us understand Matthew, we do break it down into these sections that have a, often a beginning and end to them to just kind of get our arms around some of these concepts. And right now, we're in the middle of a section in which Matthew's allowing us to see Jesus prepare the 12 disciples for ministry after he's gone. As I've said multiple times, the disciples have some growing to do if they're going to be able to do what he will call them to do, and that's make disciples of all nations. Because although they are growing, they're still not fully getting it. Now, last week was a pivotal moment for the disciples as well as the Matthew's gospel. It's that kind of a climax moment. It's what all of Matthew's gospel is pointing to. As we saw last week, Peter stand up and declare, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. I mean, this is what all of Matthew's gospel is about. And then Jesus responds to that and says, yep, that's right. It's on that truth. It's on that fact. It's on that gospel. It's on that doctrine that I, I am the Christ and I will build my church and I won't allow anything to ever overcome it. Uh, this movement, this gospel will stay to the end. And it's really that declaration and it's that belief, it's gonna give them the ability with the help of the Holy Spirit to do what God's calling them to do. So it seems as though, after we come off last week's passage, they finally got it, right? You're the Christ. Yet like all of us, when we first have belief, we're still in process, and they don't fully understand it, therefore they can't fully live it out yet. So what I'm going to do is we're going to read through the passage, it's pretty small, and then we're going to come back to it and break it apart. So Matthew 16, verse 21, starts and says, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, teachers of the law, and then they must be killed on the third day, and, and then on the third day, be raised to life. Now, it, it, the way it's said, it's like this is not just a one-time meeting. It, this is a discipleship process. He's explaining to them what's going to happen. Verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. And that also, in the original language, isn't a one-time event. It, it, it's, it's, it's stating like he's having these discussions with Jesus. And this, in these discussions, it's never, Lord, he says, this shall never happen to you. Verse 23, Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. Maybe not the most encouraging words he's ever heard from Jesus. You are a stumbling block to me. And here's the key. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. So as we saw last week, they know he's the Christ, yet with their old paradigm of what the Messiah was going to be, they still don't fully understand what Jesus' first coming was all about. So here we have another pivotal moment as we learn just as our opinions and our desires and our perspective and our will isn't always trumped by God, so too is true with the disciples. There's still some perspectives, spiritual expectations that Jesus first has to remove from them and then he's going to replace it with gospel truth. Yes, they got it right that he's the Christ, the son of the living God, but they still don't understand what the first coming of the Messiah was all about because they still don't understand why he's there. They still don't understand what he's come to save us from. And that's why I, I titled the message Following God's Will, but what I really wanted to title it, but it would have just been too long, was we need to submit to the will of God even when we don't like it, understand it, 
or want to do it. That's what we're really unpacking in this passage. And the reason why we need to submit to God's will, even when we don't fully understand it, is because we never have the entire perspective that God has. And to be honest, this is what scriptures are all about. Throughout almost every page in every story of the Bible, it is continually contrasting God's truth of what reality actually is versus our temporal view that is often actually not the truth. For as many of you know, scripture clearly says in Isaiah, God speaking, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither your ways my ways. And then he says this, for as the heavens are higher than the earth. So I want you to get the, the amount of separation between these two concepts. It's about as big as you can get. He says, as far as those two things are apart from each other, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts and plans are higher than yours. And so here today in our passage, we see Peter rebuke Jesus for declaring that he's gonna be crucified in Jerusalem. But in Peter's paradigm, in Peter's view, in his understanding, his reality, how he's always viewed the Messiah to come based on his desires, Jesus dying, this cannot be true. Again, last week, he has just proclaimed that Jesus is the Christ of the, uh, and he's the son of the living God. Yet as one scholar said, you can throw it up on the screen, he's just declared him the Christ Yet when Jesus made a statement that did not fit Peter's ideas and paradigm about the Messiah, the apostle held to his way above the Lord's and found himself contradicting the Son of God he had just confessed. Now, I think this is a really important concept, so let me just kind of break it down a little bit differently so you grasp it in case you lose it in that statement. Jesus speaks truth, a truth that didn't fit into Peter's world, how he thought, his paradigm, his liking, it didn't fit in how he wanted things to be. He had just confessed Jesus as Lord, yet he chooses to speak, wish for, and desire something that's contradictory to God's will. You can take that off the screen. You know, I think we laugh a bit when Peter stands up and it actually says in the Bible that Peter is rebuking Jesus. Wow, he's rebuking Jesus. You know. I know I'm not the only one here, but there's been a few times in my life I've gotten upset with the Lord, but to rebuke him? You know, when I get upset, it's more something like, seriously, Lord, come on. I know you're God, I know you're in charge, I know you understand, I know you're better than me, but this whatever it is, it's brutal. Can, can we do it another way? So let me ask, would you ever rebuke God? Now, I know your initial answer is never, right? That's the Sunday school answer, never. I would never rebuke God. I would never have the arrogance to tell God he's wrong. Yet, how many times has the Bible spoken a clear truth that you don't like? How many times has the Bible asked you through, uh, God has asked you through scripture to live in a certain way or give up a certain desire or believe a truth that you either don't like or is completely contrary to what our culture says is good? And when it does, how many times have you just ignored that biblical truth and really in the end did what you wanted instead? See, in a sense, you're doing exactly what Peter did, rebuking God. You're saying, I believe my ways are better than yours. My truth is more true for me than yours. See, I've already said the Jewish people and their leaders have grave mis misunderstandings about what the Messiah was going to look like, but because the 12 in many ways shared in those same false notions, Peter says, you're the Messiah. You're the Christ. You're not gonna die. Get your head out of the ground. You were born to restore Israel and its kingdom here on earth. This idea of the Messiah suffering on a cross was absolutely unthinkable to the Jews. Never even thought of it, never even heard of it. As a people who are chosen, the chosen nation who have experienced so much oppression and defeat, to think that their promised Messiah was gonna come and purposely lay down his life, not just to people, but to, to, to lay down his life to their own people, it was unthinkable. Another way to say this is that truth, that doctrine, that reality never crossed their minds. And because of this, it was a major stumbling block after Jesus died and rose again to the Jewish people actually coming to faith. So the disciples are going around in the beginning, if you remember, they're sharing it with the Jewish people. They want the Jewish people to accept this. But the thing that was holding them back was they would say, wait, 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 what are you saying? 
Jesus died? And they say, yes, then he can't be the Messiah. In fact, Paul says it this way. Remember, he was a Pharisee. He says, we preach Christ crucified, meaning the central theme of the gospel message, the central theme of everything that we believe is Jesus died on the cross. But then he goes on to say, but that's the stumbling block to the Jews. And yet, it's all over the Old Testament. It's prophesied multiple times, and they miss it. If you've been around for a while, I've shown you this before, but I think it's important to show you again here. The Old Testament, our, our Bibles are amazing. I hope you understand that. Our, our Bibles comprise you know, 66 books written by 40 different authors, three different languages over multiple continents, and yet it comes together perfectly to teach one thing, Jesus Christ crucified. From beginning to end, salvation in Christ and Christ alone. In the Old Testament, though, there was two sets of prophecies of a coming Messiah. Of course, the second coming that we know very well, probably if you spend a little time in the book of Revelation, that's in the Old Testament as well. But there was also prophecies of a first coming. But they viewed all these prophecies as one. I don't know if you've ever been hiking and you're climbing up this giant hill and you think you're getting there and then you realize it's just a first peak and then you gotta go back down a valley to climb even higher. They viewed the prophecies as one coming. And so, for instance, in the Old Testament, there were many prophecies of the second coming, the conquering hero, uh, Messiah, such as the Davidic covenant. The Davidic covenant was promised to David that from your line there will be a Messiah and he will sit on the throne of God forever. Daniel 7, you can throw it up on the screen, it says this. Daniel has a vision and he writes, in my vision there was, uh, there was before me, excuse me, in my vision there before me was one like a son of man, which by the way, that's a messianic title. Uh, what does Jesus often call himself? The son of man. See, a lot of people try to argue that Jesus never claimed to, be, claimed to be the Messiah. Son of man was a messianic title from the Old Testament. So every time he says son of man, calling himself that, he's claiming to be the Messiah. There's a reason why the religious leaders got upset when he used that term. So he says, like a son of man coming with the clouds, he approached the ancient of days, God, the Father, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, men of every language worshiped, and his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. This is a second coming prophecy in the Old Testament. It reads very much like the book of Revelation, if you've ever spent any time in that. But we also have prophecies all over the Old Testament that talk about the first coming, suffering servant. Psalms talks about the Messiah will be cursed. Uh, the Psalm talk about uh, he will be hung on a tree. Of course, Isaiah 53, known as a suffering servant, when we read it now, understanding what we know of the, the Gospels, it's very clearly describing Jesus. Isaiah 53, I want to read a lot of it because it's such a beautiful passage. But I want to remind you as we read this, Isaiah, this is a fact. You don't have to believe in Jesus but here's a fact. Isaiah was written 700 years before Jesus showed up. And this is what it says of the Messiah. You can put that up on the screen. He had no beauty, beauty or majesty to attract us to him. They were expecting him to come from like a, a kingly line. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our affirmities. He carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God. When he was on the cross, they were saying, he's cursed, look, smitten by him, afflicted. Verse five, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brings us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. This is the gospel in Isaiah. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We all sin. Each of us has turned his own way, and the Lord has laid on the Messiah the iniquity of us all, our sin. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. He's alluding to the Passover lamb. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants, for he was cut off from the land of the living for transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich, 
in his death, which is so amazing because he died with these wicked people around him, and yet he was put in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, which was a rich man's tomb. An ordinary person would not be in a tomb like that. And so prophesied 700 years, die with the wicked and, and be in a rich man's tomb, though he had no, done no violence nor deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. We have the exultation talked about in Philippians. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant holiness, he will justify many and will bear their iniquities. We have the gospel, the suffering servant, the first coming. And so we have these two sets of prophecies in the Old Testament of a Messiah to come that are seemingly contradictory. One of a conquering hero that's going to establish the throne of David for Israel forever, and one who will come and suffer many things for his people and die. And so the big question is, if you're these people, you're greatly oppressed, you're under Rome's yoke, which set of prophecies are you going to lean into? Are you going to lean into the one that's going to come and suffer and die? Or are you going to lean into the one that's going to establish Israel and establish his kingdom that you're a part of because your ancestry? Which one will you focus in on? And so with all that said, I think it's important to note that not even Christians can know and understand God's ways fully. Yes, we submit to his word and we ask the spirit of the living God to illuminate his truth, but even then, at times, we're gonna get some of this theological stuff wrong. The disciples shared Peter's belief that Jesus was the divine Messiah, but they also shared in his confidence that he was this conquering hero Messiah that could hardly be rejected by his own people, much less be put to, to death by him. So let's come back to the passage with this understanding, why they're, 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 they're not seeing it correctly. Verse 21 says this, from that time, it's a transitional phrase that Matthew often uses when Jesus is transitioning in his ministry. And so he's transitioning here from public ministry really to private. Yes, there's still gonna be some public ministry, but he's focusing on the discipleship of his disciples. And so as he focuses on this discipleship, it goes on to say, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. He must go and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, teachers of the law, and he must be killed, and on the third day, be raised to life. Up to this point, Jesus has definitely already alluded, uh, taught on his rejection and crucifixion, but it was definitely one of those things we see, it's just, it's just going right over the disciples' head because of the paradigm I showed you. They view the Messiah as a conquering hero to come. They just don't catch the suffering servant thing yet. But he's taught, he's taught them about it. And so later, when he's risen and he starts teaching them, they're looking back on some of these things. They're going, oh, I get it now, right? Matthew 12, he says, the son of man, he calls himself that. The son of man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. They're just like, whatever that means. He even said pretty clearly, I'm gonna give you the sign of Jonah. Then he explains what he means by that. The sign of Jonah is just as Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of a fish and then came out, I'm gonna spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth and I will come out again. Right over their heads. <laughs> they don't even catch it. When he's in uh, Jerusalem for the first time for the Passover, um, he has a confrontation with the religious leaders and they're arguing and Jesus says this, destroy this temple and in three days I will rise it up. Of course he was speaking of his body yet every one of them including the disciples thought he was talking about the literal temple. But it's here that Jesus begins to explain to the disciples the divine plan of God for salvation from eternity past. He's sitting down with them and saying, okay, I've been teaching all these things publicly, but I need you to understand the gospel. And in doing so, he shares with them four things he says he must do. He says it twice in the passage, I must do these things. He must do these things. So are there some things that God must do and if there are some things that God must do, are there some things that God cannot do? I remember when I was in high school, I clearly remember this. I, there was a time there, my sophomore, junior year, that I became a bit of an aggressive evangelist. Not necessarily the best style I, I've ever used, but in some of these conversations, I will never forget this one time, I, I ran into this atheist who obviously had some background in these conversations, and we were talking about God and Jesus and the Bible and these kind of things, and, and uh, then he asked me this question. He said, hey, is there anything that God cannot do? And I said, no, God can do everything. And he said, okay, can God build a rock so big that he can't pick it up? And I said, 
See the conundrum? It's, can he build a rock that's so big that he can't big, he either can't big that, build that rock or he can build it and he can't pick it up. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, I thought I was rocked. And so let me answer the question for you. Are there some things that God must do and some things that he cannot do? The answer to that is yes. See, God has revealed to us in his word that he has some what are called unchanging, intrinsic attributes. Intrinsic means it's who he is, the fiber. It's like water is wet. You cannot make it wet. It is wet. He is these things. So let me give you a for instance. God is holy. That means he's separate from sin. Therefore, God cannot sin based on who he is. God is also truth. He literally is the definition of absolute truth. Therefore, God cannot, the Bible says, lie. God is also love. Therefore, there's some things that Jesus must do that drives him to the cross. This must he talks about here. He's the one that says it. It's the divine, essential, unalterable plan of God set in motion before the foundation of the world to save us from sin. Let's dive in. So number one, he must go to Jerusalem. Now, before he creates us, he makes a choice. Because Jesus says very clearly, no one takes my life, I'm laying it down. So this was the choice of God before he created time, before he created the foundations of the earth, before he created us. He knew when he created us because of sin, what it would cause him to do, die on a cross. And so where's the choice? He made the choice in eternity past to create you and then die for you. But by the way, take a step back and think about that for just a second. He knew before he created us that it would move him because of his character to die on a cross and he thought of you and he thought of me and he said, worth it. That's amazing theology. I wanna make sure you understand that he doesn't create us and then in Genesis, Adam and Eve sin and he all of a sudden goes, "Uh uh-oh, I didn't see that coming. I gotta come up with a plan, no. He had the plan before he created us. And so sin enters the world. So stay with me, it's kind of like a bit of a math equation. First, God is holy, which I've already said, separate from sin, and because we're sinners, there's a separation, there's a chasm between the two of us. That's a problem, it needs to be solved, and we can't solve it on our own. The second problem, we don't talk about this a lot in the church these days, but I'm telling you, it's the truth So you can not like the truth, but it doesn't change it if you don't like it. The second truth about God, the Bible teaches it from beginning to end, is that is God is just. It's all over scripture. This is why when we sin, he can't just say, ah, don't worry about it, your sins are forgiven. It's good to go. Just don't, don't, just work hard to not do it again. No, there has to be price paid. Because he is just, it's who he is. And so therefore, the Bible teaches he is going to pour out his wrath on sin. So we're separated because of sin. We're gonna receive his wrath poured out on our sin, which if, if, because we are human, we cannot sustain it, we cannot survive it, therefore there's death. But then the third attribute comes into play that drives this must to go to Jerusalem. God is love. Scripture says it so clearly you don't, know, you don't know love because you do, you do not know God, for God is love. He's the very definition of it. And so because God is holy and just, we have a problem that only he can solve, but because he's love, he dives in. So let's just let the story play out. He's given us the opportunity to choose to love him or not. By the way, what is sin? The simple definition of sin is God gave us the law in the Old Testament to show what perfection is, and any time we go against the law, we sin. Jesus says it this way. He says, if you love me, you will obey me. See, oftentimes in our American culture, we talk about love and we talk about all these feelings. Love is not a feeling. With love come feelings, but love is the decision that we make. And so he says, love me by obeying me. And when we disobey, we therefore do not love and then we sin. We have a problem. Again, the chasm because we're not holy 
and then justice will be poured out. But thank the Lord, that's not where it ends, right? The story doesn't end there. Because he's love, he cannot watch us pay that price. And he, because he's God, eternal and perfect, he can pay that price for us, and that's what drives the cross. And so Jesus, in eternity past, willingly lays down his life and goes to the cross. Two really important things happen there. One, God pours out his wrath on Jesus. This is what scripture teaches. His wrath is appeased as he pours it out on Christ on the cross. All our sin is laid bare on him. His wrath is received there. Now we have a decision to make. We can choose to accept this or not, but when we do, things happen that are really important. Number one, it teaches us that the blood of Jesus Christ, as you hear me say all the time, covers us so God no longer sees us and our sin, but his righteousness, his holiness is credited to us. Therefore, because he is holy, we can now enter into the presence of a holy God. But something else happens. God's wrath is gonna be poured out. It's like, think of a rainstorm, it's coming down. You have a choice. You can either stay out in the rain or get under an umbrella. Jesus is your umbrella. Wrath will be poured out, and you have a choice to step underneath the umbrella of Jesus because God's wrath has been poured out on him instead of you. So because of this, God wanted to redeem us. He provided in the Old Testament, you know, the animal sacrifice, sacrificial system in Leviticus. It was always imperfect, but it was to foreshadow the ultimate sacrifice of the Messiah, the Passover lamb. So why must he go to Jerusalem? Well, how God set it up through David, they built the temple, they built it in Jerusalem where they would sacrifice to God. It became known as a city of sacrifices. And because Jesus is the ultimate Passover lamb, offering himself, as Hebrews says, once and for all, it was done in Jerusalem to satisfy the law. So we must go to Jerusalem. Now that first must, based on his intrinsic characteristics, really encompass the other three. But it goes on to say, number two, we must suffer many things. I've already laid out in Isaiah, it's imperative that the Messiah would suffer, and yes, we'll see in just a second the ultimate suffering is death, but it says in, uh, in Isaiah, as he experienced, he was despised, rejected, he was not esteemed, he was afflicted, he was crushed, oppressed, and stricken. By who, by the way? By the very people he came to die for. It's them who hate him, refuse him, reject him, and kill him. He's called a man of sorrows. And I, I, I can't say this for sure, but I think one of the things he suffered the most was the people that he came for are the ones who reject him. In fact, it says in Luke, it's a beautiful passage, right after the triumphant entry, if you know what that's about, he's entering into Jerusalem for the last time and they think he is the conquering hero Messiah. They do everything that the Old Testament said they should do when the Messiah comes, palm branches, uh, Hosanna, son of David, the whole nine yards. He's the conquering hero, he's gonna come in. They didn't know he was gonna come to die. But right after that, he goes and sees Jerusalem and the passage says, as Jesus moved towards Jerusalem, he stopped and wept. And I think it's this moment that he becomes overwhelmed because he sees these people, his people, that are going to kill him. And he says, if you just known, if you just seen the signs, if you just caught what I'm about, you too would be saved. Thirdly, he says he must be killed. The Greek word behind killed is not used in the context of a legal proceeding. It's not like a jury and a judge, someone did something wrong and then there's execution. No, the Greek word is used of murder. He must be murdered. Jesus was not legally tried or proved guilty of any wrongdoing, but was sentenced to death on false and vindictive charges of the Jewish leaders based on false testimony because they were determined to get rid of him no matter the cost. It was God's plan that at the hand of man, he would be murdered. It's like any sacrificial animal in the Old Testament, that little lamb in the backyard of e in Egypt while they were still there, it didn't do anything deserving death, yet the lamb lost its life as a sacrifice so another could live. It wouldn't be a sacrifice if it actually deserved death. Why is this a must? Well, I've already largely laid out, but to further my point, in the law, because of sin, uh, God says through Leviticus, there will be no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. To show us the seriousness 
of our sin. And of course, it's all alluding to the ultimate sacrifice, the Son of the living God. And then four, a very important must, he must be raised on the third day. Without this component, everything we believe is in vain. Let me just say it as clear as I can. It, listen, if Jesus did not raise from the dead, if the tomb is not empty, if Jesus is not alive today, we're all wasting our time. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians. He says it clearly. He says, if Christ is not raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. He goes on to say, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and here's the kicker, you are still in your sins. The resurrection is a vital must, because in doing so, Jesus not only defeated sin, but the greatest enemy of all, death. Therefore, because he has the power to raise himself from the dead, he has the power to do the same for you. Without it, there's no hope. Now, Peter's response to this makes it seem like he either did not hear that or did not understand it. You gotta remember, the disciples at least, we don't know for sure, but at least have seen Jesus raise two people from the dead. He raised Jairus' daughter and the widow's son. So they either did not hear it or they did not understand it. Maybe they're thinking, okay, if he dies, though, who's going to raise him? So it goes on, verse 22, Peter's, uh, it says, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord. Never, Lord. It shall never happen to you. The dichotomy I want you to catch is he calls him Lord. You're in charge. You're my master. You're the leader. I'm your servant. Yet I refuse and reject your plan. And so besides the obvious gospel implications of the passage I've already laid out, the plan of salvation that you can either accept or deny, it's up to you. I think the takeaway for us as believers, the dichotomy is calling Jesus Lord yet rejecting his plan. See, Peter could not understand, of a, he had no concept of a humiliated, abused, crucified Messiah. And so Peter's rejecting God's plan of redemption. And honestly, I don't think it was so much of what it meant for Jesus. I actually think it was more of what it meant for Peter. See, Peter, in his mind, still, he has that second coming idea of a Messiah. So for Jesus to die, Peter then loses everything. He doesn't understand what the resurrection is about, so he loses everything. He just spent three years of his life following this guy around because he thought he was that second coming Messiah. And he's thinking to himself, listen, if he dies, I just wasted three years of my life. Jesus just put him in charge basically of the 12 and so he's kind of like this up and coming power position. If Jesus dies, I lose that. He has no concept that he's going to lay down his life for the gospel. And so as we see in next week's passage, it's greatly connected. The cost of discipleship, the cost of following Jesus. He doesn't have any understanding that to follow Jesus, to deny oneself, pick up your cross and obey him. To follow Jesus means to deny what you want and obey. We cannot call him Lord and then deny his plan, which I've already laid out is his revealed will in scripture. And it doesn't just mean the plan of salvation, although that's most important, you cannot deny his plan. But also, as a believer, once you give your life to him, you cannot deny how he's asking you to live your life and what he's calling you to believe. And you can see this is what Jesus says next. Jesus turns and says, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block. He's saying, it's gonna be hard to die anyways. We see in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is struggling with this concept. He says, Lord, take this cup from me. And he's saying, Peter, you're not gonna make this harder than it already is. But the key is this. For you do not have in mind the things of God but the things of men. You're rejecting the will of God because you're putting your own opinions and what you desire above what God wants. We're gonna move into a time of communion and it's connected. You know, almost every time we do communion, I remind us why, why Jesus did this. He, he, he wants us to never get too far away from the central theme of the gospel. He knows how we're made. We, get to, we begin majoring on the minor stuff, and he never wanted us to get too far away from the central theme that we've laid out today, that Jesus died on the cross, and he rose again on the third day. Salvation is found in him and him alone. He never wanted us to get too far away from that. But the other reason why he institutes this is so that we, on a regular basis, are getting right with the Lord. And so as we go into this time of communion today, what I'm asking you to do is have the courage before you partake, to just pray this, this question. Lord, would you point out to me one thing? We all have something. Would you point out to one thing in my life 
that's out of line with your will. One thing in my life that I'm really basically saying, I know better than you. One thing in my life that I'm basically rebuking you with, saying my truth is higher than your truth. And ask him to reveal one thing. I'm not asking you to do 10 or 15 or 20 because then you end up doing nothing. One thing. And then just spend some time confessing that sin, asking for forgiveness. Ask for him for the power and desire to leave whatever that is behind. It might be a belief, it might be a wrongdoing, it might be something that you should be doing that you're not, I don't know. But have the courage to pray it. And then when God reveals it, get right with him. And then you can know on that area as you leave, you are made white as snow. Let's pray. God, thank you for the word. Lord, thank you for how just absolutely miraculous it is and how it all comes together. It all points to you from beginning to end. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for that fact that in eternity past, you willingly laid down your life for us. I would pray for every one of us in this room, the spirit of the living God would move and he would just allow us in that one area of life to just lay it at your feet. And then Lord, empower us to leave it there. Lord, help us as a body get right with you. I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.